This was actually uh, Chandra's idea. Um, a couple of months ago, she asked me, what do you talk to your father about? Does he give the same advice at home that he gives on stage? I said, it's actually 10 times worse at home. He's actually much nicer on stage. So she said, okay, then when, when we do this whole event, why don't you ask him certain things that maybe he'll be willing to answer if you ask him? So I've attempted to, I've made some notes. If I look at my phone, I'm clearly not texting and so on. I'm just uh, looking at my notes, yeah? So, uh, and one other thing, in professional settings, I refer to him by his uh, professional initials, NRN. Certainly not what I call him at home, because sometimes people find it weird, so just a, a disclaimer. So, um, so NRN, um, maybe we'll start with something simple and then we'll build it up. So why did you choose to become an entrepreneur? And, and beyond the, the reason that you've often stated publicly, you saw a market for software and so on and so forth, but what was your personal desire? What was your, what was your emotional need to become an entrepreneur? And I ask this from the perspective of many entrepreneurs in the audience, you know, and so on. Well, uh, before I try and answer that question, let me say there are two things that have happened today which have, which are somewhat unusual for me. One is the excellent uh, set of answers given by Ashish. So much of wisdom in his answers. I enjoyed every minute. Therefore, following him is not easy. Number two, I have never been never had a conversation in public with somebody with half my age. <laughs> so, therefore, that again, given that I will soon be entering my 78th year, you know, it, it makes me somewhat uh, uh, less confident than what I would like to be. Well, the, the question that you asked is a very important one. I was a strong leftist when I was a student. And then I went to France to work there. And I, on Saturdays, I went in to Sorbonne and had lots of uh, conversations with the capitalists, uh, socialists, and communists. And I finally came to the conclusion that the only way a society can indeed remove its poverty is through the power of entrepreneurship, the power of creating jobs, the power of translating ideas into jobs, power of translating ideas into wealth for some, in, some people, investors, and power of in enhancing taxes paid to the government. And that was primarily the reason why I, when I came back, I wanted to conduct an experiment, my first experiment. You were not even born then. <laughs> so that was a failure. Uh, Softronics. And I learned some lessons from that. And the second one has done reasonably well. <laughs> So, uh, you know, there is uh, often, a, uh, at least when you read the media, you feel there's an allure around entrepreneurs because if you're a very successful entrepreneur, you make money and so on. That's what, it's one side of life. But, Hold it to you, near you. Sorry, yeah. that's one side of life, the success that entrepreneurs see and so on. I would uh, say that, it to anybody, yeah. <laughs> not just because, okay, <laughs> please, yeah. So, uh, but can almost anybody become an entrepreneur or are there certain traits that you feel one must inherently have or an approach one must have to be in, to at least attempt to be an entrepreneur? Well, I think an entrepreneur must have many attributes and I'll speak only about a few. First, he, as late Robert Kennedy, borrowing the words of uh, George Bernard Shaw said, most people see things as they are and wonder why. I dream of things that never or and then say, why not? In other words, he or she must have the power of imagination. He or she must be comfortable with innovation. He or she must be comfortable with doing something unusual. 
second he or she must have lot of passion because passion is what fuels your energy your enthusiasm and your ability to run the marathon third the leader must have a very clearly uh, articulatable value system that's very very important because everybody looks up to the leader everybody looks up to the founder so therefore his or her value system must be very clearly articulatable and he or she must obviously lead by example and uh, finally i think because the task of a founder is to convince customers is to convince employees to convince investors he or she must have the ability to articulate reasonably well otherwise it just won't happen so then does the the role of a founder change over time in an organization because what you just articulated is at the very beginning but does that stay consistent does that change does that evolve how does a founder's role in a company or in building an organization how does that evolve well in the beginning it is all about imagining an idea whose differentiated business value to the customer is better than all other existing ideas that's most important second as i pointed out earlier he or she must be able to articulate the power of his idea or her idea to various stakeholders to attract good employees to attract customers it's very very difficult in the beginning because you almost have nothing to talk about the third he or she must once again i come back to them he must he or she must have high aspirations he or she must have lot of optimism lot of hope because all around you are saying nahi yaar ye to nahi chalega but it is the founder that has to sustain energy from inside and run the marathon that is the initial part the next part is selecting employee some key employees sometimes called co-founders and what i call early adopters and for that as i pointed out earlier your job is all about passionately articulating why you are going to change the world second you have to use innovative methods to convince your customer that you who has really nothing is indeed better than backing somebody who has everything you know in uh, 1983 when uh, we went to myco we were competing with very powerful and rich people for the data center operation thing i realized that the only plus i had was my ability to use mathematical modeling to demonstrate that our computer for data center was much better than the other fellows so i used a book which obviously you know uh, called jo you know uh, jo luc buyer he was used to be a professor at university of washington seattle he had written a book on quantitative methods in computer architecture i used that book and i made a presentation my presentation was to be for 20 minutes it went on for 8 hours and i asked them we have have you were have my competitors given you this data no so i think the second phase your responsibility is to use some smartness to use your passion with customers investors and and uh, you know employees and this is the 
time when you have to sacrifice very heavily. Because at that time, money is very little. Challenges are huge. And you have to, uh, to sacrifice hugely in terms of being away from family, being away from loved ones, being, being you know, I mean, traveling, you know, with, with minimal expenses, staying in hotels with minimum expenses, you know, and, and uh, economizing on every expense in the company. Of course, these days it's different, but I'm talking of the olden days. So that is another very important aspect in the building of stage. And the other aspect of entrepreneurial phase of any company is quick decision making. Everything you will have to take quick decisions. You can't say I'll form a committee and the committee will come back, will give a report and then I will decide. No, you have to decide quickly. Next, as it, you know, every startup company must have only one leader. There cannot be two leaders. There cannot be three leaders. It's just one leader. I was very, very fortunate to have, you know, to have had such compliance by all my younger colleagues. Because that, one thing, that leader earns the, the plaudits, earns the, the, the loyalty of all the younger people because he sacrifices, he or she sacrifices more than other people. He or she works harder than other people. He or she takes much less salary uh, or makes huge sacrifices in salary than other people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, I mean, this is the entrepreneurial phase. The final stage comes and that is called managerial phase. Once the managerial phase comes in, that is when you invite managers to create systems and processes, to, to create protocols, to, to invite independent directors to have a good governance mechanism. And, you know, uh, of course, by somewhere around this time, you would have got listed, then you have to provide quarterly results, you know, and uh, all of that. So the, this, this is how a founder metamorphosizes himself or herself over these phases. Right. But, and you said something very important that I think even the previous session they referred to. Uh, anybody in this crowd who has started a company has had to recruit people. And when you don't have much to show, um, you know, it's harder to recruit. So how did you recruit your first six or seven colleagues? Well, you know, first of all, I first had to decide what kind of people do I want to recruit. My focus was on competence, because if you don't have competence, then nothing will happen. Not, not much work will uh, progress. So first is competence. Second is value system. Because value system is required because in the beginning, everybody has to trust implicitly everybody else. Nobody should say, when I'm sleeping, the other fellow is putting his hand in the till. In the till. Third, the only thing the employees of the company have are your words. There is no guarantee, nothing, whether this idea will take off or not. So in order to engender such a trust amongst the, the people that you recruit, you must be authentic. In other words, you have to walk the talk. You must be, you must be truthful. You must be trustworthy. You must be, you must demonstrate your passion. You must walk the talk. And once you do that and then create a dream, you would have already created a dream. And once you paint the dream in rainbow colors and talk about the good days that will come, 
if all of us do what is needed together as a team in unison then there is a reasonably high probability of people buying your vision and that vision at the end of the day must have something in it for everybody that is in the team it cannot be that only you know four of us will make a lot of money and rest of you will suffer no I, it just won't work so you have to create a vision which is a win 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 that kind of stuff and once you do that then you have selected the right kind of people and you have convinced them through your passion through your authenticity through your storytelling through the stories of all other wonderful entrepreneurs who have succeeded and i think you are only enhancing the probability of success yes but you were 35 two children uh, 80s india no, so no you are not at born sorry <laughs> one w- one on the way one on the way oh, yeah. one child and one on the way uh, and if it didn't work maybe you'd be a 40 or 42 year old mid level manager at most at that point in 80s india i can't imagine there was a market for hiring a lot of those people in software those days yeah. so the risk for you is very high and then on the other hand most of your initial younger colleagues were 20, early 20s they presumably had more options um so how did you convince at least tell us one or two of them how did you convince them that hey they should listen to this 35 year old versus pretty much doing whatever else they wanted to do yeah. look i was the head of software at uh, patni computer systems limited and all these guys i had hired them well chris was one person who was hired by ashok patni from id patras but the rest of them i had hired and they were all five six levels below me for example nandan i hired as a software engineer trainee shibu i hired as a software engineer dinesh i hired as a software engineer ashok arora i, I hired as a software engineer trainee raghavan i had hired etc etc now when i started out on this journey they all knew that i was earning a much 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 higher salary than all of them number 2 they also in some way i was not talking as much as i do today they realized by my action that i had a big dream and i also talked to them about how there was going to be an extraordinary revolution in the us in terms of super mini computers and oltp transaction monitors and relational databases on those super mini computers how the uh, departments of large computers and mid level corporations and small corporations were going to embrace computing technology for commercial ac- uh, applications in a big way and the us was going to be eternally short of te- technical manpower and we in india had lots of youngsters who had who were smart but had no jobs so therefore i gave them a a reasonably consin- you know, convincing argument that the future of this company would be better because they also knew that i had failed in my first attempt and i had explained to them that there was no market at that time because there were very few computers in india i was looking at the domestic market and therefore they when i gave this argument they understood that that we were going to look at exports we are going to look at the most dynamic market in the world the most competitive market in the world etc that's how it because i was talking to a couple of founders and we have all had this experience where we have to actually convince parents of some of the of the folks saying no no it, you should let your child join it'll be okay and so on did was that experience true back then as well or is that more of a recent phenomena we have to convince the family hey it's okay i mean i imagine it must be even harder then than than now you know it's very interesting rohan we were eight children my mother was always in the kitchen we because we 
she cooked on wood wood stove morning 6 am to night 9 pm and father took his government job too seriously he was away in the office from whatever you know 8 am to evening 8 am at home also there would be fellows meeting so somehow that environment gave us lot of freedom they didn't ask us what are you going to do <laughs> have you eaten well <laughs> you know have you slept well these were not the questions my my father asked no i meant in in terms of the families of any of the people you had to recruit did you have to convince them and or their families or their friends their their social environment that hey it's acceptable for you to go work at this unknown random company i mean i can't eat in a, in a market star for jobs that cannot be a simple no, decision no i i i will tell you i'll tell you i i was very very lucky in that i had the support of my my wife your mother when i resigned on her birthday i still remember 19th august 1976 i met her i said happy birthday and then i said i have resigned <laughs> but but she smiled as she always does and she said not an issue we will live within whatever means we have i will fully support you and you will succeed so i was away in some sense i was away from all the other people that you spoke about the only person i was very friendly with was my friend okay and she was the only person in whom i confided everything that i wanted to do and she was an unbelievable supporter unbelievable supporter so i in some way my case may not be normal but i was very lucky to have that person so then surely i mean building on that there would be again everyone who's built any kind of company any founder goes through the buck stops with the founder ultimately it's certainly in the early days they go through tremendous moments of doubt uncertainty at least as far as i'm aware in no interview ever have you admitted to any of that so surely and you're not superman uh, <laughs> against all all belief uh, so in those moments did you feel hey maybe this won't work or what will i do because again your colleagues are 12 13 years younger than you you can't really go to them and say hey man i i'm really worried this is something all founders everywhere in the world go through so in those moment did you have moments or when you had those moments like that what did you do what was your plan b or how did you deal with them well you know rohan the reality of life is fear doubt uncertainty these are parts of everybody's life but it is so particularly in the case of an entrepreneur as i told you when i decided to leave my job and start it i i i said look i have got this wonderful job i am getting so much of money you know my wife has got a job in uh, uh, telco in nanavati mahala in bombay everything is fine no i am i first already i have failed once so is this the right thing i am going to do it was then second when i had to get the first customer database corporation there were so many odds against us there was lot of fear lot of doubt third when we had to get the first domestic customer so that we could have a steady stream of revenue from our data center activity we were pitted against huge guys that was also lot of doubt about self lot of fear when we went public that was a big time of doubt fear uncertainty 
whether it will do well or not whether it will and make it didn't, it and in do very well the first time in india yeah, yeah yeah i'm saying and then there was the issue of i had to take a decision 1995 not to renew the contract with a fortune 10 company and at that time the revenue from that company was forming 25% of our revenue we had just gone public and all the other big guys i don't want to mention their names but everybody knows who are the top 4 5 people you know uh, players in our field all of them signed on the dotted line i was the only crazy guy and all my anger colleagues were not in favor of uh, not continuing with it that was a big moment of fear and doubt so what again this is what i learned from my wife and that is she said in fact i still remember i told all my colleagues who were sitting there that look i have to make a call on the landline outside it was in taj residency i went out i called her and i said look so far you have looked after the children totally but for the next 4 5 years you have to do it even more of it because i will be away anywhere between 250 to 300 days in a year because i am going to take a very tough decision the toughest in my life and that will only be possible if you agree with because others were not even mohan was against it she said don't worry i am always with you and more importantly she said there are times when logic doesn't hold good there are times when you have to transcend logic and embrace faith and that is the time when you will believe in god will all fructify because as bhagavad gita says karmana adhikaraste and all of that that is do whatever you are supposed to do to the best possible uh, way in it, the best possible manner and leave the rest to god so i think in some way in the time when we have all of you have fear doubt and uncertainty do the best that you can do get into further and further detail and delineate after all what is uncertainty uncertainty is only that the probability of an event is low or a certain thing and what did bayes theorem tell all of us bayes theorem said by obtaining more and more information you can enhance the probability of that event right so that's what she said and that's what i followed so i don't think you people need to worry too much about fear doubt and uncertainty have faith in god but before you have faith in god you have to do everything possible under the circumstances then everything will be fine but living under that kind of constant uncertainty fear self doubt uh, does that what does that do to you personally or what did it do to you personally your personality because that's a, seems like a fairly extreme way of living for decades together or at least let's say the first two decades maybe not four decades you know it's uh, i'm glad you asked that question that evening when we when i took the decision at taj residency fanish was just joined as the head of sales and i were in the same car we are going back to the electronic city of the wretched road everybody knew at that time two and a half hours we are back I to was, same place now <laughs> anyway sorry <laughs> no but that is a fact anyway yeah, agreed agreed <laughs> sorry uh, uh, you know and then i was somewhat silent but i was saying some reasonable words to fanish but fanish got upset with me he said mr murthy you don't seem to be worried you are least concerned about the company 
Then I told him something which is so important. He said, I said, look, Fadish, when a child is not well at home, neither of the parent shows panic. The father gives confidence to mother, mother gives confidence to father, because by becoming panicky at that time, you will only make things worse. So therefore, one principle I adopted, and that is, when I left the office at 8.30 in the evening, and I was back home by nine o'clock, by which time, you and Akshata would have finished your studies, your mother would have made sure that you had done all your homework and all of that. We would take you to MacFast here. Amen. And just seeing you people enjoy eating that pizza or whatever, you know, you people wanted, that brought so much of joy and happiness to us. And of course, to boot, <laughs> while returning, you would lie down on the road in front of that toy shop saying, surprise, I want surprise. this cement toy. <laughs> no, but, but, but I enjoyed it every minute. I enjoyed it because I needed a light moment. I didn't want a serious moment. So I think every one of us will design and invent, or not invent, you know, kind of uh, create certain unique ways of making your own uh, mind relaxed and also finding some kind of calmness. Um, I'm just checking. I, I don't know how much time we have left. The monitor doesn't show me either. So can someone cue me? <laughs> no, no, I don't want to hold the next speaker. I know there's a next event. So... Chandra, maybe you'll cue me? <laughs> oh, wow, okay, fine. <laughs> so, so but, but in all of these years, again, whenever I ask these questions, I was just imagining there'd be many founders in the audience. Of course, of course. I mean, I'm projecting some of my own experience being founder as well, certainly in this conversation, asking these questions. Um, so you, you go through these moments, tremendous moments of uncertainty and doubt, self-doubt uh, and so on. But during that, how do you keep your team together? How do you keep them still believing? And I don't just mean, you know, your six younger colleagues, your co-founders. I meant, you know, maybe there are 50 or 100 or 300 or 400 people. How do you keep them still believing? You know, that is where... Because inside, sorry, inside, you will have tremendous self-doubt, but you have to now project confidence to a larger group. No, that's, that's what parents do. That's the... That's the primary job of parents, to bring a certain sense of uh, calmness to the environment at home, to encourage the children, to tell them that there is no problem, right? So therefore, what I would do was to, to crack jokes in the office and to start on something new, I mean, it may not be very strategic, but something new, and then talk to them about how other people have gone through bigger, bigger problems than we, than we are going through, how God is with us, you know. And then I would tell them, look, last night I went to Raghavendra Swami Mutt. So I think these things give them, give people some confidence. They... In, in other words, look, the whole human relationship is based on faith and trust. Uh, husband has trust and faith in wife. Wife has husband, uh, you know, trust and faith in husband. We have faith in God. You know, all of that, right? So, therefore, creation of trust is is by showing them how authentic you are, how genuine you are in caring for them, how you are always there to take care of them, you know, uh, by, by doing very simple things like, you know, let's say we would go to a, a, a canteen or canteen. There was only one canteen at that time. So I knew that, let's say, on one of those days, I'd say, Dinesh liked something. So I would give part of my food to him. 
I would say, Dinesh, please, I know you like it, eat it. So I think small things in life make a lot of difference in raising the confidence, trust, and faith of, of your youngsters in you. So therefore, we all cannot keep on telling lies because the moment they think that it is all lie, they won't trust you anymore. So you have to be authentic as much as possible. But you should not be panicked. You should not, you know, make them uh, kind of start crying. But, uh, yeah. One of the things you always told me is, uh, I mean, it's not just entrepreneurship. It's true for all of life. That life is a series of compromises. And you say some of the compromises are geometric progression, some are linear progression, and so on. And I don't know if you'll want to answer this publicly, but I'll still ask you. What is the most significant compromise in your professional life that you've had to make? If, if you don't answer specifically, you can tell us at least the philosophy behind it. No, I think I will give you a general gan <laughs> because there are so many wonderful entrepreneurs and they too would face it. See, the, the, any group, any team has a portfolio of some people who lack transparency, some people who do not take any bottom line responsibility, some people who are waffling, some people who start biases very quickly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It, is, it is always there. Now, the smartness of the leader, which all of you are, is to realize it and to the extent possible emphasize the strengths in situations and de-emphasize weaknesses in situations. There is no 100% solution to any of these. In a, let's say you are in a discussion where you are discussing the next quarter result. Supposing there is somebody who has a habit of leaking. I, I, I mean, I've come across such people too at Infosys. Uh, not among my uh, co-founders, but somebody else. Now, then the best thing to do is to, in a nice way, without that person losing his face, make sure that he's not part of that discussion. So what you're doing is you are reducing your risk. You are de you are de-emphasizing the 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 uh, weaknesses. So I think that is the only way. I have deliberately not answered, given specific examples, because that's not the purpose of this discussion. Mm -hmm. Because those examples may not mean anything to any of them. Fair enough. Fair enough. But just switching gears a little bit, right on top of moving away from all the uncertainty and fear. The positive side, you know, there was, um, there was an analyst report, I think late 90s, maybe early 2000s, that said Infosys was God's own company. That was the title. Uh, and it listed all the first company to give stock options in India. I suspect many people here know. In fact, it had to, there had to be some case in the Supreme Court to, uh, that had to be resolved for we this. We won that case. Yeah, to, uh, to make uh, it possible. Thanks to, thanks to Mohan. Yeah, yeah, thanks to Mohandas Pai, yeah. and that made it possible for all future generation of companies in India to do this. Um, first company to do this, first company to do that, to voluntarily declare quarterly results when it was not really mandated or required for listed companies, and et cetera, et cetera, and so on. It feels like, at least, at least to me, when I read these things, a lot of these things come out of the philosophy of the founder of some kind of philosophy, some kind of culture that the founder must believe in. And then the organization is a manifestation of all of these things. Is that a fair assessment, fair characterization? And if so, then how important is the role of a founder's philosophy in building an organization, in creating a deep culture that permeates through all levels? Oh yeah, I mean, you hit it, you hit the nail on the head. It's extremely important. Uh, the founder, at least till he or she retires, has 
the imprint of his soul on how deliberations take place in the company. In our own case, because I was a leftist to begin with, because I came from a family of eight children and a high school teacher as father, so therefore we were lower middle class, we were taught that sharing is caring. You were encouraged to share. Now, similarly, I have had teachers who emphasized that when you people are playing football or soccer, look, it, it doesn't help if you try to take the ball from one end of the one goal to the next yourself. The smartness is to share the ball with others, to give a pass. So I think there were a lot of these influences. Second, as I pointed out earlier, my own experience in France and in getting converted from a confused leftist to a determined, compassionate capitalist. capitalist. Uh, I mean, well, what do I mean by a compassionate capitalist? And that is conservatism in economic matters, liberalism in social matters. So I think, and the kind of company that you keep, the kind of trust you build in your people, uh, the kind of sacrifices that I, that I saw in my younger colleagues. You know, I mean, people would be in the office up to 4 a.m. to complete the annual report for five, six days. And I would be going character by character through that. No, my doing was somewhat simple because you know, I had a car, I would go home. But there were people who didn't have a car. They had to get some rickshaw or something. So when you see such examples of commitment to the company, my view was that the, the best way of deriving happiness and joy is to share whatever little fruit is coming out of this exercise with as many people as possible. That is why we distributed as much as $20 billion amongst our people. And uh, so I think it is a combination of all these. And therefore, I think, for example, punctuality. I would be there in the office at 6.20. So at that time, People realized it, so people would always come on time. I did not have to tell anybody, Bhaiya, you have not come on time. No, because your actions speak louder than your words. And, you know, excellence. I would go and go and visit toilets. People knew that this guy is visiting toilets to make sure it's clean. So automatically, it gave a lot of importance to the janitors who clean the toilet, it increased their pride in their work, and it gave a message to other people. So I think in some way you're right, Rohan, that the founders have the potential to leave their footprint on the company, to leave, to, to meld their soul with the soul of the company. So, um, I hope I didn't say something silly because... No, I'm not, to ju I'm not the one smiling. to judge. <laughs> Clearly the audience is the one to judge, right? Uh, no, but I this is in addition to, you know, the stock options and so on for everyone, but also at a personal level, right? Um, I've always wanted to ask you, what is it? Is it that you didn't like money? Why do you not choose to keep, you know, because your cap table, right, looks very different from how all of us modern entrepreneurs would create the cap table. Uh, if one were to call it a cap table at your time, but you chose not to keep as much of the company in its very inception. Wh why is that? I mean, I can't really relate to that decision. <laughs> you know, no. I, I mean, by I, I mean I'm projecting here. I no, really, really, I know. I don't know. 
I mean, the, the, the reality is I can only speak for myself. I enjoyed the company of people who are happy. I enjoyed the company of people who felt I was fair to the extent possible. I enjoyed the company of people who thought that it was their company. I enjoyed the company of people who showed more enthusiasm than, than me in some many ways. So I knew that in order to do that, I cannot say that I will keep the major percentage and then you guys do that. That is my personality. I'm not saying there's anything right or wrong about it. These are all personal philosophies. And as I told you, uh, you know, I, uh, the, 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 the character that has impressed me most in Mahabharata is Karna. Nobody else. Because of his generosity. So I think that that that's the way that I grew up. Right. <laughs> Switching to something somewhat contemporary, Chandra and I were talking. Sorry? Switching to slightly more contemporary issues that Chandra and I were talking about, which is, you know, even in the previous session, there's debate on governance, young companies, and so on. But actually, you know, in some sense, from a younger entrepreneur's perspective, you have to recruit people, you have to succeed in the market, there are lots of difficulties and challenges and problems. Now, on top of that, you have to do good governance as well. So, feels like a lot to do, isn't So, is good governance something you worry about in the beginning or you worry about when you're successful? Or when, when do you start thinking about good governance for a young company? You know, you don't have to teach a child to start breathing. The child starts breathing when it is born. You don't have to teach a child to cry when it is hungry. It automatically asks, in its own way it cries and you have to give food. So I think there are certain characteristics of human beings which have best, which are best acquired from very early days, very early days. And that happens because of family, because of early teachers, because of the environment you live in, because of the philosophy that you have imbibed, in my case, compassionate capitalism, uh, because of the role models that you have had. So I think somehow it is very difficult for me to say that I will start good governance once I become a $20 billion company. I think that is... Uh, so, so you say it's a philosophy that you either you imbibe yeah. or you don't. Yeah. It's just a way of life. Yeah, yeah. Got it. The last section, um, just, yes, uh, oh, that's actually helpful. Yeah. Uh, since you're talking about, you know, the importance, for example, of good governance or other things, these are philosophies that one accumulates through one's life experiences. Yeah. What is perhaps, uh, maybe you can share one example, either from your family, your friends or teachers, because you refer to these three uh, uh, these three stakeholders quite regularly. One example from your early life that you believe has influenced how you have led your life in a, in a professional setting, but you learned perhaps early on. Well, I think uh, it was my high school headmaster in Mysore city. He was extremely strict, very, very strict. Now, he was teaching us chemistry and that was the last class of the day for 
4 p.m. to 5 p.m. And I was sitting in the front bench. And that day, he was conducting an experiment where he needed to put common salt into a test tube. And he was being very, very careful about the amount of common salt that went into the test tube. I had a friend of mine called Anand Srinivas Prasad who was sitting next to me, and he burst out laughing. So Mr. K.V. Narayan stopped the experiment. He came uh, to our front bench, and he said, Eggman, what is so funny about what I was doing? See, children are generally more honest than elderly people. They have still not acquired the art of lying convincingly. <laughs> Anand Srinivas Prasad said, Sir, you are extremely stingy with common salt, which is so inexpensive. That's why I laughed. And then he said something which has lived with me even today. And that is, he said, Engman, this common salt belongs to this community called Shadavilas High School. It belongs to you, it belongs to me, it belongs to all the 50 students in this class, it belongs to all the students in this high school, it belongs to every teacher, every staff. Therefore, I have to treat this common salt with utmost respect. And he said, on the other hand, five o'clock, our class is finishing. Please come with me to my house. I will give you a glass full of common salt free because that's my personal property. You know, I, uh, Rowan, you remember uh, Sudha telling a, a story about my foolishness or idiosyncrasies at 40th year of <laughs> infancy. I think you were there, right? I think some of these things uh, stick in your mind. They don't go away. These they form indelible mark on your psyche. The whole emphasis was run on that principle. That is, put the interest of the community ahead of your personal interest in everything you do in the short and medium term and you will be a winner in the long term. So I think that is one thing that has stuck with me. And I think it will be there till I whatever, go away. Yeah. And last question, and then we are done. So is it ultimately destiny, or is it luck for an entrepreneur? You know, I am a very traditional person. I believe in God. Whatever that be, I don't, I don't want to enter into arguments with people. I have derived a lot of value from faith because I have been in a lot of situations where I could use logic and I'm not bad in using logic, reasonably good. But in spite of it, I couldn't find an answer in logic. And that's when I refer, I pray and that has given me a lot of uh, strength. And as I think it was either Emily Zola or uh, Louis Pasteur who said, when God is shy to announce his presence, he comes in the form of chance. Therefore, luck is extremely important. You know, and I, there are so many classmates of mine who are smarter than me. But they didn't have the luck to be where I was. So I think luck is very, very important. Luck also, once you believe in luck, it also brings a little bit of humility in you. So I believe in luck. Great. With that, we are done. Thank you. One second.